Shalom. We're continuing with the Gospel according to John. We're looking at the Hebraic background, and today we're in chapter 11. There's not that much to talk about in chapter 11, but I'm going to read through the whole chapter for the sake of continuity, starting in verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is sick. When Yeshua heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Yeshua loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that said he to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. So just a quick note on the names of the people. Mary, we know, is a common popular name from the Hebrew name Miriam, the most famous of whom is Moses' sister. Marta appears to be an Aramaic name. If you are familiar with the term Maranatha, it breaks down into two parts, Maran, which means Lord, and the Atha part means he will come. So Marta appears to be the female form of Maran, like she's some kind of lady. Lazarus is based on the Hebrew name Eliezer, and there are quite a few of them, Abraham Steward, Moses had a son named Eliezer, Aaron had a son named Eliezer. We're also going to meet Thomas, and in John, several times, it, it tells us that Thomas was also called Didymus. So this is interesting because the word Didymus means twin, and so does the word Toma, Toom, in Hebrew. So he was definitely a twin. The name of the town, Bethany, Bethany, is the house of possibly affliction or unripe figs, dates. Maybe that's not so important, but we should keep in mind that it's a mile and a half from Jerusalem. Continuing in verse 8, his disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone you, and you are going there again? Yeshua answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of, of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbles because there is no light in him. These things he said, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Yeshua spoke of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Yeshua unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. So it is not uncommon in many cultures to find sleep as a euphemism for death. Psalm 76, 6. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and horse are cast into a dead sleep. It's a deep sleep, and the word there is tardema, which is used also for when God puts Adam in, in a sleep to take his rib, when he puts Abraham in sleep, when he walks through the pieces of cutting the covenant. But literally, we know that the chariot and horse are dead. 1 Corinthians 11.30 For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. 1 Corinthians 15.6 After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Talking about the resurrection took place when Yeshua rose from the dead. Some different 500 people saw him. When I moved to Georgia, I heard this phrase, dirt nap, which is a very colorful euphemism for sleep. And I thought, actually, that it must be a Southern thing because I'd never heard it. But on looking around, I see that it actually probably came from the war in Afghanistan's relatively recent 1981. Continuing in chapter 11, verse 16. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Then, when Yeshua came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off. Remember, we said it was about a mile and a half. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Yeshua was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Yeshua, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever you will ask of God, God will give to you. Yeshua said unto her, Your brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. 
There is very little information pointing to resurrection in the Tanakh. Here are possibly the only two references. Isaiah 26, 19, Your dead men shall live, together with my dead body they shall rise. Awake and sing, you that dwell in dust, for your dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. In this case, the dead is not the word literally for dead, but the word is rephaim. Daniel 12, 2, And many of them that sleep in the dust of earth shall awake some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So we see that the whole doctrine of the resurrection of the dead was developed in between the end of the canon, the prophet Malachi, and those 400 years of silence. We see that the Jewish theologians of the day discuss it, and we know that they came to different conclusions because the Pharisees believed in it, but the Sadducees did not explanation from the Talmud from Sanhedrin 92. Ravas says, from where is resurrection of the dead derived from the Torah? It is derived from a verse as it is stated, let Reuben live and not die, in that his men become few, which is a scripture from Deuteronomy 33. This is interpreted, let Reuben live in this world and not die in the world to come. Ravina says that resurrection is derived from here, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awaken, some to everlasting life, and some to reproaches and everlasting disgrace, as we've already discussed from Daniel. Rav Ashi says proof is derived from here, but go your way until the end be, and you shall rest and arise to your lot at the end of days, speaking of the scripture in Daniel. Continuing in the text, verse 25. Yeshua said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, the master is come and calls for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Yeshua was not yet come into town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goes unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Yeshua was, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. When Yeshua therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit, and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Yeshua wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? Yeshua therefore, again groaning himself, came to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Yeshua said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinks, for he has been dead four days. So we learn from rabbinical writings, Bar Kapara taught, The most intense time of mourning is only on the third day. For three days the soul is hovering over its grave, believing that it will return to the body. When it sees the radiance of the face has changed, in other words, at this point, the physical body has changed, and the soul supposedly can tell that. It goes and it leaves. This is what was written, but his flesh on him is painful, and his soul mourns over him, which is a scripture from Job 14. Another tradition, we go out to the cemetery and examine the dead within three days, and do not fear being suspected of superstitious practices. So this was second and third look to make sure the person was really dead. It happened once that a man who was buried was examined and found to be living, and he lived for 25 years and then died. Another, so examined, lived, and begat five children before he died. So without the modern medical instruments that we have, it's more difficult to tell, is the person actually dead? There are cases of Hindu yoga practitioners who are able to put themselves in state of suspended animation where their breathing is so slow and they don't eat and you can't really observe their natural functions, and yet they live. My mother told me many years ago that when she was a little girl, her grandmother died and they had actually slept in the same bed. 
And her parents asked her, my mother, was she afraid to sleep in the bed where grandma had died? And she said no. And then she told me that they put a glass of water and a washcloth in the window so that if the soul came by, it could wash itself. Continuing the text in verse 40, Yeshua said unto her, Did I not say unto you that if you would believe, you should see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Yeshua lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I knew that you hear me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that you have sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound with a napkin. Yeshua said unto them, Loose him and let him go. This is a bit of a play on words because the whole concept of loosing has to do with the forgiveness of sin. We know that sin binds people the way grave clothes bind people and that sin leads to death. Now Lazarus is completely free. Continuing in verse 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Yeshua did believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them the things Yeshua had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What shall we do? For this man does many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation does not perish. So we see that the priests are jealous for their position. They're afraid of losing their position. Now when Yeshua came into town, he gave no credence to their authority, to their hierarchy. He didn't check in with them and say, hey, I'm the Messiah, check me out. He came on his own authority, which he said many times. He had two witnesses, which was all that was required. He had, he had himself having done the miracles and he had the father. Of Caiaphas, not very much is known, except he very well may not have been a Levite, and he was quite corrupt. So from verse 51, and this he spoke not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yeshua should die for the nation, and not only for that nation, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together to put him to death. Yeshua therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence into a country in the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many of them went out to the country, up to Jerusalem, before the Passover, to purify themselves. Then sought they for Yeshua, and spoke among themselves, as they stood in the temple, What do you think? Will he not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he was, he should show it, that they might take him. So here again, we have another chance to talk about the ten lost tribes. And if you haven't listened to the podcast about that, I'll put it here again. Overall, we have to understand that Ephraim is a shadow picture of the Gentiles. And what we're going to see here is that Yeshua is giving up his residence in the land of Judea, in the land of the Jews, and he's going to live with Ephraim. They're not Gentiles at this point, they're Ephraim. But we see this split through history that there are two people groups that belong to God. There are Jews, traditional Jews, who are keeping the Torah apart. And then there are Christians, traditional Christians, who are keeping the Yeshua apart. And from now on, we're going to see he's living in Ephraim, a shadow picture that the Gentiles will be responsible for him. And we're going to see something else later. Who comes to take his body? Joseph of Arimathea. Where is Arimathea? It's Ramatayim. It is the birthplace of Samuel in Mount Ephraim. This is a shadow picture of those who are going to steward the life of Yeshua and his teaching. We also see the people going up to Jerusalem for ritual purification. Now there's a lot of different purifications that are listed. For example, in Leviticus, it talks about spiritual uncleanness that results from sexual relations. 
This is not a sin, but it makes one spiritually unclean. Rabbi Yitzchak said, a person is obligated to purify himself on a festival, as it is stated, and their carcasses you shall not touch, they are impure to you. This is a command in Leviticus 11. This verse is referring to the festivals, as is taught in the following Baraita. Just to further clarify this, even though Ramban Nachmanides lived many years after that, this sort of explains what they mean. This is not a prohibition saying that we are not to touch these carcasses. Rather, scripture states that there are carcasses you shall not touch, for they are unclean to you, meaning to say you cannot touch them without becoming unclean yourself. The meaning thereof is to state that all those who touch them should be aware that they have become unclean and should therefore be careful not to enter the sanctuary because they're ritually unclean, nor eat of the hallowed offerings. So this is one part of the purification. And during the year that the people have been gone, that they haven't been up to Jerusalem since six months before the previous Sukkot, everybody is going to be in some kind of a state of ritual impurity, particularly if one comes in contact with a dead body. The only solution for that purification is the red heifer. And you can read about that in Numbers 19. Probably most of you know that in September of 2022, five red heifers were shipped from Texas to Jerusalem. And they have to be a certain age. And I think one or two of them have already turned that age. And they have to have no white hair. Here you see the heifers being examined with a magnifying glass. They have to have no blemish. Once that heifer is found, they can do the process of making its ashes so that the people can be cleansed. They can be put in a state of ritual purity to come up and celebrate the feast, especially for the Levites. This is absolutely required. So right now, all eyes are on Jerusalem. Will they do it this year? We're around the corner from Passover. I don't know, but we will see. As I have often said, the occurrence of the event will answer all your questions. In the meantime, you, you keep your eye on the sky because that's where your redemption will show up. Shalom.